Order the Wednesday, January 19th, 2011 meeting of the City of Santa Barbara uh, Creeks Restoration and Water Quality Advisory Committee. Uh, I'd like to have the uh, clerk uh, call the roll and determine that a quorum is present. And uh, by way of doing that, I think we'll notice that we have a fantastic uh, new clerk. Uh, Jen uh, is also uh, connected with this uh, incredible uh, lemon pound cake. So uh, fire away. Hi. Chair Moldaver? Here. Sorry. My thing went weird. Mr. Bullock? Here. Mr. Smith? Here. Ms. French? Here. Ms. Lomas? Here. Ms. Weber? Here. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I'd like to explain to the public before we get to the approval of the draft minutes of the November meeting that, as you can see, we have two fantastic new members of the committee. And uh, starting on my left, uh, I'd like them each to introduce themselves, uh, and um, we can move on from there. Hi, I'm Leanne French. Hmm. Good evening, Danielle DeSmith. Yeah, uh, thank you so much. Uh, that brings us to uh, item number three, approval of the draft minutes of the November 17th meeting, uh, attachment one. Are there any uh, corrections, amendments, or additions to the draft minutes, or is there a motion to approve them as submitted? A motion to approve. Is there a second? I second. It's been moved and seconded to accept the draft minutes of the November 17th meeting as submitted. If there are no further questions, all of those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Are there any opposed? Are there any abstentions? I abstain. I abstain. Yeah, thank you very much. So the draft minutes are adopted five to nothing with two abstentions. That brings us to item number four, uh, adjustments to the agenda. Uh, Mr. Benson, are there any proposed adjustments to the agenda? No, Mr. Chair, but I just uh, had a couple of announcements. First, I wanted to welcome all of you to and wish you all a happy new year. <clears throat> uh, in particular, I wanted to welcome our new members, Danielle DeSmith and Leanne French, and uh, to the committee and thank them for their interest in serving and for being here tonight. And then I wanted to introduce the committee to our newest staff member, probably the only person on our staff you haven't met, and that's Jen Hollywood. And she's just started with us after the new year, and she is our new administrative specialist for the Creeks Division. Um, and then lastly, I wanted to uh, take an opportunity for us to thank uh, uh, an outgoing member of our committee. And, and Mr. Chair, I think you might have something for that. Uh, yes, thank, thank you, Mr. Benson. I was wondering whether Daniel Wilson could uh, approach the lectern. And uh, I want to mention to the people at home that we're especially honored uh, that our liaison for the city council, Councilwoman uh, Michael Self, uh, is here uh, to assist us. And Daniel, in December, completed seven and a half years with the committee. And Daniel, of course, has a very successful uh, landscaping design and gardening business in the South Coast. And of course, he's a graduate of the Brent School for Environmental Science Policy and Management at UCSB. And I think we'd all agree that Daniel has been the voice of active conservation and restoration for water, for plants, for riparian, for ecosystems. Uh, it's been a deep value as well as a matter of principle and policy with him all the years that he's been on the committee. And therefore, in recognition of his stellar service for seven and a half years, we want to uh, present this certificate of appreciation to Daniel Wilson. We were going to present it to you at the December meeting, so note it, it had the December 8th, uh, 2010 date. Uh, but there's no way that we can sum up 
in a couple of moments everything that you've meant to this committee, first to Jill Zachary, our founding staff member, now to Mr. Benson, uh, to George and all the other people you've served with, including our Planning Commission liaison, Michael Jordan, who was chair of the committee when you were here. So allow me to come forward and present this to you, and then if you have any uh, related remarks, uh, this would be a great time to entertain them. Live. Hello, Daniel Wilson, yeah. Chair. Thank you very much. I really appreciate that. It was uh, definitely has been a uh, it's been a, a real experience serving for the last however many years. Uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to just speak for just a couple minutes. I have just a few outgoing words uh, to everybody, and I'm wondering if perhaps. You wouldn't mind passing these to the committee members. Um, this is, uh, I sort of titled it, Encouragement Support Letter for Future Successes. And this is largely addressed to you, members of the Creeks Advisory Committee. And there's certainly some comments here for Creeks Division staff and absolutely the public at large. Hopefully, there is public at large watching right now. So the last uh, eight or so years, that's eight or nine. Uh, volunteering on the Creeks Advisory Committee has been interesting, educating, uh, frustrating, rewarding, and encouraging. Creeks Division staff is consistently pr proving itself to be very solid, dedicated, intelligent, knowledgeable, creative, and now quite experienced. The projects that are currently and have been recently been undertaken appear to be optimistically successful. Creeks staff has tremendously leveraged outside funds. Creek staff is now garnering substantial momentum on large capital improvement projects on city public land. Whereas our creeks are comparably clean and in as good condition as many throughout Southern California, they appear to be on the road to measurable improvement. But a few questions for you. Would you bathe in Lower Mission Creek? Would you allow your kids to play in or eat anything from the lower reaches of our urban creeks? In order for there to be truly restored creeks and improved water quality, and in order for there to be steelhead not just swimming, but spawning and repopulating our creeks, you, the Creeks Advisory Committee, the Creeks Division, the City of Santa Barbara, and the public at large, public watching now, must tackle the difficult aspects of our creeks that we've inherited from the previous several generations. At some point, we must realize that for our market improvement in water quality, projects must happen on privately owned and held lands. The vast majority of property abutting our creeks is privately held property. We are not likely to exceed in truly achieving the stated goals in Measure B unless we have successful public-private partner, partner, public partnerships where trust prevails and collaborative supportive work happens. The Creeks Division has not yet shared or supported this view to the extent that I feel is necessary, perhaps for lack of available energy and staff resources, being that they are very busy with some very positive and successful projects, perhaps for lack of will to take on unknown working relationships with varied private parties, perhaps for initial uncollegiate response from a few private groups a handful of years ago, Perhaps it's for lack of strength from the city attorney feels that the city has to be resilient in the face of unknown litigiousness. Or perhaps it is for lack of support from the administrator straight up through to the elected officials. In reality, it is likely a piece of all these things and probably more. Regardless, this committee, you guys, has the ability and purpose to provide direction, support, and encouragement to Creeks Division staff to develop and foster strong productive private partner, private public partnerships. The public, hello, hopefully you are watching tonight, the viewers, you also have the right and the responsibility to provide guidance and support to the Creeks Advisory Committee and the Creeks Division staff as well. 
Without the committee and the public body at large coming forth and supporting such programs, water quality improvement and creek restoration on the whole will evade us. In order for big things to happen, we must think big and we must act big. So please come forward now and support public-private partnerships and collaborations or wait till the opportunity presents itself with a program or proposal. But don't wait too long because the sooner we start, the sooner we succeed. Remember, the hundred or so years that it has taken to hurt our Fowler Creeks may take another hundred years or so or more to, um, to really repair them. For we can't, so we must, uh, we can't simply sit back and hope things will happen on their own. This is a participatory democracy and we'll get out of it what we'll put into it. So in closing, my last nine years or so, eight years, whatever it is, involved with the Creeks Advisory Committee has been reasonably positive and hopefully my efforts have yielded some net ecological and public benefits. To this end, it is now time for me to move on and focus on more business and family related interests. Also, as my efforts to encourage Creeks Division staff to develop a healthy public-private partnership program has yielded not as much fruit as I would have hoped. Hopefully you, my successors and colleagues, will be able to carry these ideas forward. I wish you all the best and thank Creeks Division staff for their excellent community and ecologically oriented work. Thank you for uh, a couple minutes here, Chair. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Wilson. I, I know that you're certainly going to be missed, and I hope uh, as a member of the public actively involved in habitat restoration, you're still able to come uh, and join us uh, whenever you're free. I, I would like to point out as we shift from um, item four to item number five, uh, for the benefit of the people at home, uh, a different uh, department of the city of Santa Barbara, as you remember in the early part, of the last decade brought the issue of watersheds and private property before the city council and the city council directed uh, staff boards and commissions not to advance in that direction further until uh, the council advised us to so uh, you had some remarks uh, uh, indicating you wish there had been more courage or imagination on different levels of municipal government but I think that the staff and the attorney's office and the council and this committee were trying to carry out a very clear mandate from uh, the mayor and the city council. And so I think that's something that we're still going to have to continue to work on for the future. But uh, I appreciate your comments, and I can't say that people disagree with them. Hmm. That brings us, uh, thank you, Daniel. That brings us to item number five. Uh, public comment. Any member of the public may address the committee for up to one minute on any subject within our jurisdiction that is not scheduled for public discussion before the committee on the agenda today. Are there any members of the public who would like to speak on public comment? Uh, could you identify yourself uh, for the record? Thank you, Chair. I'm Daniel Wilson, a member of the public. I. Uh, I am relaying some information that was uh, communicated to me the previous month when I was still, I guess, technically public at large representative for the Creeks Advisory Committee, and uh, had a conversation with uh, Dr. Newman Newton, excuse me. And uh, there were two things he wanted to communicate with the Creeks Division staff and the Advisory Committee. One of them was that he uh, offered some um, very strong positive support for the city's support of the Mutt Mitt poop bags, doggy poop bags along our city trails, and just as an active user of the trail, he uh, commented that he unfortunately found very many bags with poop in them tied in little neat knots on the side of the trails. His suggestion was that perhaps a little bit of public education at trails on high usership days might go a long way, perhaps a sign, and my suggestion is maybe instead of green bags, maybe they're bright fluorescent orange or yellow bags. They might be more likely to get carried out. Uh, and the, the second aspect that was uh, communicated to me that I just wish to carry forth was uh, actually something that may be a little bit more appropriate for the uh, water quality report, but just to take advantage of the couple more seconds right now to share it, is that uh, there was a question to what extent was the uh, dredging that this, 
happens down in the harbor, to what extent does the dredging potentially affect uh, water quality sampling and observations in and around the public beaches? So that's just sort of a question I'll put out there, and uh, I believe there is some public interest in that at all. Thanks, Chair. Appreciate it. Um, thank you, Mr. Wilson. Are there any other members of the public who will wish to address the committee on any items that are not on tonight's agenda? Hearing none, we will move on from item number five to item number six, committee member and staff communications. Uh, Mr. Benson, do you have any communications to report since the last meeting? No. Um, I'd like to assume the prerogative of the chair uh, for communications to or from the committee to see whether uh, our council liaison or our planning commission liaison, Mr. Jordan, uh, have any special uh, messages or thoughts to share with the committee uh, before we go forward? Uh, Councilwoman Self? I also would like to thank Mr. Wilson for his service to your committee, and I want to welcome our new committee members on, and uh, you're doing a good thing for Santa Barbara, and I appreciate you taking and not just the new ones, but the existing members also, for taking time out of your busy schedules to move this forward. Thank you. Thank you very much, Councilman Self. Um, that will bring us to item number seven, uh, election of the vice chair. And I'd like to remind uh, members of the public that we tend to go in two-year cycles where we institute a new chair which will be Mr. Bullock, who was the vice chair last year, who will be taking over at the February meeting. And at this meeting, we will select a vice chair for 2011 uh, with the hope that uh, all things being equal at the end of the year, that the vice chair this year will be able to move up to be the chair of the committee last year. And that's based on a publicly uh, derived uh, procedure that the committee uh, and the council came to about five years ago. Uh, and it's worked pretty well so far. So the agenda, agenda item is the selection of a new vice chair for 2011. Are there any nominations for the position? I'd like to nominate Betsy. Uh, Betsy Weber has been nominated. Is there a second? I second. All right. Uh, would you be willing to serve if you are chosen? <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, are, there, are there any other nominations uh, for vice chair? Is there a motion to close nominations for vice chair? I motion we close the nominations. Uh, is there a second? Second. Um, thank you. All right, it's been moved and seconded that Betsy Weber, uh, a committee member in good standing, be named uh, vice chair of the Creeks Committee for 2011 uh, with the hope that she'd be able to succeed as chair in 2012. Uh, all those in favor of the nomination of Betsy Weber as vice chair signify by saying aye. Aye. Are there, are there any opposed? Are there any abstentions? Uh, Betsy Weber is uh, unanimously selected to be vice chair of the Creeks Committee for 2011. Uh, congratulations, Ms. Weber. That brings us to the business items of today's meeting. Uh, item number 8A, Santa Barbara Zoo Wetland Margin Enhancement Project, uh, which will be a presentation by our Creeks planner, uh, George Thompson. Uh, Mr. Thompson, are you ready to go? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Chair Moldaver. My name is George Thompson. Uh, for those of you that I haven't met before, I manage about 15 projects for the Creeks Division, everything from s small, single parcel uh, invasive plant removal projects to larger capital projects. And the, the project that I'm going to be talking about tonight is the Santa Barbara Zoo Wetland Margin Enhancement Project. It's a partnership with the Santa Barbara Zoo and several nonprofits in town. And we're just about to begin uh, groundwork on the groundwork, that is. Uh, the project takes place uh, on the wetland margin between the bird refuge on the right of the screen and the zoo. And it's outlined there by the, the orange uh, 
arrows. And for those of you not familiar with the area, this is Cabrillo Boulevard and uh, the far eastern portion of East Beach there. So the zoo property is actually owned by the city, as is the bird refuge. Uh, but the parks and recreation department doesn't do active management of the zoo property. It's it's managed by a, its own nonprofit. And so they've done over the years several improvements to the landscaping and done several bioswales to improve stormwater quality runoff from the zoo. Um, and then on the right, where the bird refuge is, that's managed by the parks division. And they also do some active management and developing long-term and short-term uh, management plans for that area. The margin has a lot of invasive plants in it, and so really this project presented a great opportunity for the Creeks Division to get involved because some of those invasive plants are ones that we're targeting for removal elsewhere in the city. And that's where my involvement is. It's targeting one specific plant that I'll talk about in a moment. So really the big goal is to remove non-native invasive plants, but after you do that, you really need to restore that habitat so you don't leave a, a void space where invasives can be reintroduced. The plant that I'm going to be focusing on is the one on the left here, giant reed. It looks a lot like bamboo, and most homeowners and community folks that I talk to mistake it for bamboo, but it's actually not. Um, it basically displaces native plants like willows and other native species and degrades wildlife habitat. And so it produces flowers, but it doesn't really produce seed. It reproduces from stem segments. And so there aren't a lot of wildlife resources in terms of food. It does provide some protective habitat cover, but in doing so, it basically decreases plant diversity by displacing all of those numerous native riparian plants that we find along our creeks. And so Arroyo Borough watershed is probably the worst area within the city. Also Lower Mission Creek is also infested with it. As you go to other towns in Southern California, um, they've got huge problems with Arundo or Giant Reed. And in terms of invasive plant removal, you really want to get in there early before you have a really serious problem. And so other communities like Ventura, if you're going across uh, the Ventura River mouth, that's what you see there is giant reed. It's very labor intensive to remove. And so the earlier you can get it, the more money you save in the long run. It also produces a lot of downstream effects when we have big storms. It doesn't have a very extensive root system. So when we have these big flood flows, it basically breaks off of the banks and floods downstream areas by butting up against bridge abutments and other areas that are impeding the creek. Um, the two other species that we're targeting in this project are Cape Ivy and Myoporum. Cape Ivy is found uh, mostly underneath oak woodland ground cover stories there. And again, it's a plant that can kind of creep up on, on plants, on larger plants and overtake that habitat. And then Myoporum is a plant that's used in the landscape trade but it's also dispersed throughout the landscape by birds and can re-sprout re new colonies far away from where it's planted. And also, in the past five or so years, it's been infected by this thrip, which basically curls the leaves, and so it has a really unsightly appearance now. Here's a ground-level view of Arundo. Uh, this is from the zoo property. Here you can see their little uh, train track system, which is internal to the zoo. This was probably planted as either a vegetative screening, and over the years it's displaced more and more of the native willow habitat and some of the wetland edge vegetation. And so we're really, the Creeks Division in particular is going to be targeting this plant. As I mentioned before, the second component of the project is once you get the native plants out, you, or non-native plants out, you want to restore them with a diverse palette of native plants. And really the goal here is to increase plant diversity, which in turn increases insect diversity and bird diversity by several methods. One, it has um, a longer flowering period, and certain plants will flower at different times of the year, so you kind of spread out those resources through time. Um, but they're also um, aesthetically pleasing to a lot of people. When you see California rose and some of these western goldenrods in natural areas, it really brightens up the landscape. 
So the project scope is really restricted to that narrow margin along the bird refuge uh, wetland edge between the zoo and the bird refuge. It's about 3.2 acres, and in a moment I'll describe how we're breaking up those 3.2 acres into two project phases. Um, over the two phases that we're going to be doing, we're going to install over 2,400 native plants, and that's composed of about 15 different species but we're only removing three or four non-native species, so we're really increasing that plant diversity. And then we're going to be maintaining the site with drip irrigation, which is low water use, and also doing manual weeding. So the Creeks Division really has a very narrow scope on this project, on the Arundo Donax. Our project partners have a really wider scope in looking at restoring ecosystem functions such as wildlife habitat, and really getting out a broader range of those non-native species. Channel Islands Restoration is our main project partner. They're a local nonprofit group, which has done a lot of restoration on the Channel Islands, as their name suggests, but also on the mainland. They're very experienced in this type of work. And they also have a huge outreach and education component. So they do lectures and classroom visits and field trips, and that's really important when you've got a great opportunity like this with the zoo, they have over 200,000 people on that little train system going by the project site, so we can really take advantage of the number of people, both in town and out of town visitors that are, are visiting that area. Um, the Santa Barbara Zoo obviously has been working closely with us. They're gonna be um, more on the day-to-day -day operations of making sure that we're complying with safety issues and um, making sure that the scheduling works with their visitors. But in a bigger picture, they're really uh, capitalizing on this as part of their overall landscape plan. So they've got really great things happening along the edge of their property in terms of native plants and reducing uh, stormwater runoff pollutants. And then we also received a $30,000 grant from the Southern California Wetlands Recovery Project through the Earth Island Institute. I'm very grateful for that, and that'll go a long way. And then we are, of course, targeting the giant reed. So we're breaking it up into two phases. Phase one, we started in January 2010, and really the past year has been spent on uh, budgeting, permitting, getting all the ground uh, work set up so that we can go in there next month and get the work done. We hope to complete all of the invasive plant removal and the in the first phase of native plantings by winter 2012. And that includes a maintenance phase. With a lot of these plants, you really need to follow up and make sure that they're not coming back. Phase one costs about $90,000. The Creeks Division is contributing up to $30,000 towards the removal of that giant reed. And then phase two is currently unfunded, but the, the thought process here is get phase one done, make it look really good, do a good job, and then bring in potential funders and have an example of, okay, we've done this work at this site, here's what it's gonna look like, and your money will be well spent. So really we're gonna uh, target grants and potential funders later this year. And it's about the same cost for phase two. As I mentioned before, a big opportunity here exists with the number of volunteers and outreach opportunities Channel Islands Restoration has a huge network, a database of volunteers that they draw on for a lot of their work. Um, and then the zoo has an equally impressive database of volunteers and families and school kids that come out and help them with their landscaping needs and, and other activities. And so we basically have a commitment from these two organizations for both the installation period and the maintenance period. And as I mentioned earlier, um, getting especially young kids in this community, getting experience out in nature where we're an otherwise urbanized city, getting their hands dirty goes a long way in, in terms of reconnecting them with Santa Barbara's uh, natural ecosystems. The last part of the volunteer and outreach component is we have funding for an educational sign. It'll be a permanent sign that'll be placed at the project site to describe not only the ecology of the bird refuge, why it's important for water quality and wildlife habitat, but also detailing our efforts on this project and why it's necessary. Here's my contact information for any of you and any members of the public that are watching this. I welcome your questions or suggestions. 
Thank you very much, Mr. Thompson. That was a very cogent overview uh, and very well presented. Are there any uh, questions uh, for Mr. Thompson or uh, the rest of the staff about this project? Uh, Paul? Uh, Mr. Thompson, thank you. Um, so phase one is, it says it covers approximately half an acre of, of land and a, a budget of $90,000 to clear half an acre of giant reed seems like an awful lot of money. Chair Moldaver and Committee Member Bullock, um, Arundo Donex is incredibly cost uh, intensive and labor intensive. Um, we can't use large machinery such as backhoes and that sort of equipment because it's in an environmentally sensitive area. Not only are we removing the giant reed, but our project partners are also targeting the myoporum and the, the uh, Cape Ivy. And so it's not just a half acre of Arundo, it's those other species as well. Um, for phase two, it's about an equal cost, but you're dealing with a lot less labor intensive plants. And so the cost goes down, but the acreage goes up. Are, are there any other questions? Uh, Ms. Lomas? Um, that $90,000 does include um, retreatment, I assume, and how many years of uh, retreatment? Um, it includes two years of retreatment, and so really the first year will be uh, intensive, and then as uh, replanting occurs, we'll go in and work around the native plants that we've already planted and retreat those. Is there going to be a retreatment component to phase two as well? Yes, there will be. Yep. And if two years isn't enough, will there be enough funding to extend that for another year or two? Yes, Chair Moldaver and uh, Committee Member Lomas, uh, this this particular project is part of a much larger uh, effort on the Creeks Division's part. And I've I've done a presentation to the pat in the past to the committee, and I'll come back and do one probably later this year on the invasive plant removal project. Um, we're targeting this giant reed throughout all of the city's watersheds. So this one is just a smaller part of the larger project. And really, my main responsibility is making sure that each of these individual sites have maintenance, that the Arundo is actually gone, that it's not re-sprouting, that it's not washing down from upper parts of the watershed and recolonating. So regardless of if the actual project gets funded in the future, we still have program funding for the giant reed removal. Thank you. Are, are there any other questions or comments? Uh, this is a comment with regards to Arundo eradication in general across all the different projects that you have coming up. Um, is, do you, is your partners have, um, what do they do with the Arundo once it's pulled out? It really depends on the project site. For some of them, we're able to chip it in a mechanical chipper to a size where it won't re-sprout. But for other projects where we either don't have access for that type of machinery or the homeowner that we're working with doesn't want that material on the ground, we really just have to truck it off to the green waste dump. Um, I have contacts for people who know how to reuse it in, into a pro make it into a product that can be reused it, into like fire logs. So if you're interested in looking at alternatives that create a reuse opportunity, I can give you some contacts. You're very welcome. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Ms. French. And um, I'm very uh, heartened by the partnership between the Creeks Division and Channel Island Restoration. Uh, I've seen their work, as have many in the community at the grounds for the Natural History Museum, uh, Devereaux Slough on the UCSB West Campus, and um, I think most dramatically at uh, Arroyo Hondo, um, uh, the old Hollister Ranch on the Gaviota Coast. And um, I agree with your uh, assessment, both of the quality and uh, their attention to community education and outreach and volunteer involvement. So uh, uh, good people to be partnering with. And also special thanks to Richard Block at the zoo for um, partnering with the city again. 
on uh, areas of common interest. Um, are, are there any other questions or comments? Uh, this item was for uh, discussion and overview, so I want to thank Mr. Thompson uh, for uh, a really solid presentation. I think it gives us a really good handle on uh, what's going on. Um, that brings us to item uh, 8B, Water Quality Monitoring and Research Program, uh, Fiscal Year 2010. Uh, that will be a presentation from uh, Dr. Jill Murray, uh, Water Quality Research Coordinator. Uh, Dr. Murray? Briefly, the goals of our research and monitoring program are to understand the levels of pollutants, identify different types of pollutants, emerging contaminants, and microbial contamination, understand what those levels mean as far as impacts on aquatic organisms and recreation, uh, look at our project effectiveness, and um, also try and find what the sources of pollution, how are contaminants getting into the creeks, and how we can ameliorate those problems. And then one of our, the most common question we get in the, uh, from the public is, are things changing? So we're constantly updating our look at long-term trends. Is it on? Oh, sorry. Apologize. And so we have several different program elements, and I've, um, those are all discussed in detail in the annual report, and you can see what the different research questions are around each of those program elements. And to support all of those questions, we have a, a detailed sampling plan, and we have a lot of different sample sites, including creek sites, storm drains, uh, ocean, and we sample some sites regularly, some sites only during special projects other sites during storms. And I, I'll stop here and say I know there are several people who haven't heard this background before. I've gone over it many times, so I'm going quickly. And I think it would be a good idea if maybe we had a smaller meeting where I could walk you through some of the work that we've completed in the last several years. So this is a recap of what I talked about at our um, update in June. We did our third year of sediment testing and according to the newly finalized state guidelines, uh, we can say that the sediments in our estuaries and lagoons are generally non-toxic and don't have any uh, high levels of contaminants of concern except for um, uh, pyrethroid pesticides. Those are also coming out as a contaminant, contaminant of, a concern, uh, of concern during our storm monitoring efforts. We started seeing pyrethroid pesticides for the first time last year in our water samples that we've collected during storm flows. Um, we did uh, an extra round of toxicity testing in storm drains that was since the last time I spoke to you, and those are, um, it was during a late season storm, so you could say that the storm drains were kind of already cleaned out by several storms that we had already had, and we found no toxicity in those samples, and we had never tested that question before. And based on our very brief sampling um, around the, the impacts of fire, we didn't see any. But again, this was really limited sampling. We sampled very early in the storm before any kind of flooding or debris flows would be a concern for the personnel in the field. And um, speaking of personnel in the field, uh, I work really closely with Jim Rumbly, who you've seen present on enforcement topics. He's the one who collects most of the field samples and uh, manages a lot of the data. Uh, we presented um, pilot, a pilot test showing that we had uh, concerns about slurry sealing of streets, as when you see the fresh blacktop on the street. And we 
had the hypothesis that this could be causing toxicity and could be leading to a lot of foam coming out of that slurry seal. And so we did a more detailed study this past summer with the help of a water quality intern and a collaboration with Dr. Arturo Keller at UCSB, and we're still looking at those results. We also continue to evaluate our ultraviolet disinfection facility on the west side, at the west side drain. Had, uh, it treats the flow that goes into Bonnet Park, and it continues to function very well at reducing indicator bacteria levels to zero, coming straight out of the project itself, but we have um, pretty quickly downstream the indicator bacteria levels um, come back up to what we would consider a background level for Santa Barbara Creeks. And I'm going to get into some possible reasons for that later in the presentation. And, but it's important to note that that uh, increase, if there's any growth of indicator bacteria in those waters, that's not representing a, a health risk. And I'll, I'll get more into that too. And then I, I talked um, last time about we had an in-depth statistical analysis con conducted by our water quality intern, Stephanie Dolmat connell and I presented some results from that. Um, the full, her full report is in the water quality annual report, and she did a, a really excellent job, and I'll touch on some of those results too. So I, one of the... Um, uh, one of the things that drove the most public curiosity and concern over the past year was the high number of beach warnings at Arroyo Borough. So I wanted to spend some time on that because we, uh, we were also concerned. We have a, a trigger, and it's based on a state law. I don't think, um, I think we're fairly unique in that we really pay attention to this trigger. But if there are ever three beach warnings in a row at a certain beach, or three out of four, we are supposed to... Uh, try and conduct some kind of sanitary survey and figure out what is causing those beach warnings. And um, just as some background, in case for those of you in the public that don't know, the law requires that the beaches are tested weekly, and it's generally done by the county. We t pick up some of the sampling in the winter, and a Santa Barbara Channel Keeper does as well. We uh, test weekly for three different kinds of indicator bacteria, um, enterococcus, total coliform, and a group that are sometimes called E. coli and sometimes called fecal coliform. If the levels exceed criteria set by the state in a law, AB 411, so a lot of times it's called the AB 411 criteria, that's when a, a warning sign is posted that says there are high indicator bacteria levels here. This might in, be indicate, indicative of a health risk. Um, so that, And then the AB 411 season is when the county is required to do this, April 1st to October 31st. The problem with the indicator bacteria is that they're not, they're generally not pathogens. They're generally indicators of potential sewage contamination, but it's becoming clearer and clearer that they're not always indicative of that. And this is a concern for all communities that test uh, recreational waters, and the US EPA is supposed to release new criteria this year. I'll be really curious to see what comes out later in 2011. But getting back to those high number of beach warnings at Arroyo Borough, uh, all beaches exceeded quite a lot last year because we had a wet winter and we're having exceedances this year as well. Um, and we know that beaches are three to six times more likely to exceed the indicator bacteria criteria um, during and following rain events. But Arroyo Borough was also exceeding a lot during dry weather, and so we're driven to ask why. This is a picture of Arroyo Borough during um, its storm flow, probably plus somewhat high tide, and you can see that during the wet weather, it's really the creek and the ocean and where the, in the, where the samples are collected are basically all the same thing, and, and we know that the creek levels are generally higher uh, during storms and, and higher than, the, than they are in the ocean. So last summer, summer 2010, there were 18 warnings posted between April 1st and October 31st. Uh, six were during wet weather and 12 in dry weather, which is a really high number. It was um, the highest number of warnings since 1997, but we had 16 warnings in 98 and in 2000. And it wasn't a particular group of indicator bacteria that were consistently exceeding. We know from Stephanie's research that at Arroyo Borough, um, 
and any, any beach where it has a, a creek flowing to the ocean, you have many more exceedances when these lagoons are actually flowing to the ocean. Sometimes they're closed. For enterococcus, it's 50% uh, more likely, 300% more likely for fecal coliform, and 1,000% more likely for total coliform. Basically, when the lagoon is shut by sand, you really never see exceedances for total coliform. It's definitely, it seems to be that those exceedances definitely come from the estuary water. And it was, the estuary was flowing every single time that samples were collected during uh, summer 2010. And this is due to just differences, and in, in we had a, a pretty high base flow from a winter of rain, and um, sometimes human activity. People like to dig the channel out there, even when the sands, the waves do cause the sand to move in front of the estuary. And in um, comparison, in summer 2009, when we had only five exceedances all summer, compared to 18, it was, uh, the estuary was closed at, ha at least half of the time. So that leads to the question, what is coming out of the creek and the estuary? And here's a, an overview photo. So here's a you know, the sample is collected down here at Royal Borough. Here's um, the creek coming out at Cliff Drive. So all of this is estuary. And um, in this picture, you can see that it's, I, it would be hard to, I don't know exactly what the sample or what, what the county would call, whether, whether this would be opened or closed, but it's not um, flowing. It's definitely the water coming out here is definitely going through sand before it gets to the surf zone. Well, what is in that creek? We know that Arroyo Borough actually has generally lower indicator bacteria levels than our other creeks, Mission and Sycamore. And there was nothing unusual, no spikes in the creek indicator bacteria levels last summer. And so we started looking at differences between, we collect a sample at Cliff Drive, we collect a sample at the estuary mouth and in the surf zone. And we've done this now for a number of years so we can look at that data and say um, it most, uh, about 75% of the time, the indicator bacteria levels go up going down that estuary. So it's really looking like we have some growth of indicator bacteria in that estuary. It's also probable that there are some indicator bacteria growing on uh, decaying kelp and some of this growth might stem from inoculation by bird waste or dog waste. It may come from the creek water itself. But when those indicator bacteria are actually growing on the beach or in the estuary water, that's not growth of pathogenic bacteria. Those bacteria would need a human host or viruses that cause illness would actually need a human host to grow. So that's, that's the, the big problem with um, trying to assess recreational um, health risk based on the indicator bacteria. And uh, Southern California Coastal Water Research Project, which we've worked with before, they're really tackling this idea of regrowth on sand and on beaches um, in their current research. So moving on to long-term trends, we talked about 2010, which was a spike, but overall, uh, looking back to fiscal year the 2009 in our water quality report, we looked at the Heal the Bay report card grades of kind of the, the trend over time there. And Heal the Bay has a pretty complicated algorithm and it has changed over the years that takes all the indicator bacteria, numbers, and exceedances for a whole year and then comes up with a report card for each beach. And so we looked at those grades over time. And there was subtle but discernible evidence that the grades were getting better, but we hadn't actually looked at indicator bacteria numbers or the numbers of beach warnings. So we went and did that. And this is also done by Stephanie, and she, it was part of her analysis looking at 15 years of data from the county, which went up to 2009. And um, here's, an, let's see. So this is an example of, um, there's so many different ways to parse this vast amount of data, but here's one example. We looked at the average um, exceedance rate at each beach, and we grouped it and took the average from uh, 1997 to 2003 and compared that to the average from 2004 to 2009 and then looked at if those were a difference. So if it, all the bars that point down below the, below the 0 percent, those have been a, a decrease in exceedance rate or an improvement in water quality. And then... Um, 
for you can see on the right the right panel Mission Creek. This is Mission Creek at East Beach. Um, so this is the surf zone, uh, and this is for fecal coliform. And this is actually the median value for the whole year. So this is a, a really gross, crude summary. But you can see that this median, despite the ups and downs, seems to be trending downward. And that was probably the best example. I chose the best example this time to uh, show you. But overall, if we look at all the different beaches and all the three different indicator bacteria groups and wet weather and dry weather, so there's 24 combinations there, um, the exceedance rates have decreased in 21 out of 24 combinations. So I think we're seeing something. Now, that's definitely going to change when we include the 2010 data and, and maybe 2011, too. I mean, so much of this is climate-driven. and um, But we also have presented in our um, water quality reports over the last couple of years some long-term creek data, and it looks like in some cases that data is getting better, too. So I just wanted to give a status update on our source tracking efforts. This is our effort to uh, figure out what kind, this is mostly um, based on indicator bacteria and trying to understand what kind of hosts would be contributing to the indicator bacteria that we see. Is this human sewage getting into creeks, storm drains, is it animal waste? Um, and we have two two projects to talk about. The first is our our larger grant-funded project from Prop 50 Clean Beaches Initiative. And we had a really, in, that was um, started and stopped based on the state budget problems, but we've been going um, for a while now and had a really intensive summer of field work and had some really, um, really great results. And we've, this is large, uh, most of the work is done with a contract with UCSB, Dr. Patricia Holden's lab and her postdoc and stat research staff. And uh, they've delivered their their draft final report, so we'll be putting that together with our efforts. Um, we're going to do a little bit more dye and smoke testing and then put together our final grant report and a user-friendly guide for other coastal managers, and that'll be delivered this year. Um, and, oh, and I also wanted to point out, and I think we'll, we'll, we'll um, add this to an upcoming e-news, but We've now been doing research with Dr. Holden for several years, and so it, it takes a long time, but there have now been several peer-reviewed academic publications coming out of our research with her, and I think that's really exciting, and it's a, a, an example of how we kind of really get a value added by working with an academic institution um, instead of always working with consultants because they're, you know, they are driven to get this pu published even long after our contracts are, are over. And then our second source tracking project is, was the sewage sniffing dog project. I, last time when I um, spoke in June, I think we had just finished a really great week of field work. And so, um, but we had also collected a lot of water samples that UCSB was going to test for their human waste specific markers, and we didn't have any of those results yet. So the, um, it was really exciting because we had a small sample size and a lot of potential complications, different dogs and vastly different techniques, but we did see good statistical results. There was positive correlation, and for a lot of the markers, it was significant. A lot of interest in the technique, and I, we just submitted the um, final report, and I think they're going to, the Water Environment Research Foundation who funded us will turn that around quickly. They really want to get it out. So that was um, a very um, fun project. And I think I mentioned that in, in that we had uncovered a... Um, we had used, with the help of the canines, found a, a leak from the sewer to the storm drain. There's a picture on the right of that being fixed. I don't even know if it had been fixed when I spoke to you. It happened really fast. And this is just um, an example of the large amount of data. I won't go into the details, but it doesn't show up that well. But everywhere there's a circle. We had responses from both dogs, and this is probably... Um, you know, one day's worth of work. Where we work when we're just using the DNA techniques, we can collect uh, maybe 10 samples a day. With the dogs, we could do, you know, but depending on how close together the different storm drains were, up, up to 50 sites. It was um, it was really helpful to have the real time results and kind of know which direction to turn as we were working our way up a network. And the low cost per sample was really attractive. So I want to finish by just giving updates on a couple of um, external 
external uh, things that have been going on. The um, State Water Board is changing its approach to assessing toxicity in creek samples. And they're, they're doing it for de dischargers of, of effluent as well. But we have used their approach to, under, to formulate our sampling plans and, and what we've cho how we've chosen to spend our toxicity testing funds. And we have um, really done a lot of testing on Mission Creek in particular because it is listed as a 303D impaired water for toxicity. And we've t um, all of our tests based on the fathead minnows, it's an acute toxicity test, have come back um, very low toxicity based on what the boards had used, the regional board and the state board had used up until this point. And they're just coming out with new methods. Now they're testing with three different organisms and um, having much more, a much more stringent approach on the statistical tests. We'll be learning more about that and revising our sampling as necessary. And then the last, I didn't know if you, any of you saw this. I hope that most of you are on the mailing list for the County Project Clean Water stakeholder meetings um, because I had seen Dr. Gretel Roberts give a really interesting presentation about biofilm growth and we wanted to have you know, maybe a, perhaps a wider audience than we get at this meeting. And so we had her present at the Project Clean Water stakeholder meeting and um, really interesting research. Biofilm is basically slime comprised mostly of bacteria. And it's, uh, you know, if you don't, if you have a hot tub and you don't put your chemicals in, you're going to get that slime on the surface. And that's basically solid bacteria growing. And so this um, consultant company, Weston Solutions, put in these, um, they call them coupons, I think that's an engineering term, of PVC and cement and put them in creek water and they were clean. And then they took, sampled them every two, four, and six weeks and scraped off the bacteria and tested them and had really fast growth of indicator bacteria. And they, they tested in Terracaucus. You see from zero weeks to four to six weeks up to 10,000 per 100 mil. So way, way, way over our limits, of course, but that could be feeding the creek water and giving it indicator, high indicator bacteria levels. And then this is um, a pie chart showing different speciation of the enterococcus that they looked at, and a lot of it was what would be considered enterococcus of even fecal origins. So even those bacteria were able to grow and grow very successfully in this creek environment. So it really changes our thinking about what ways indicator bacteria could be getting to the creek and different methods, I think, that you could use to understand the, the origins of the indicator bacteria. I'll finish up by just saying we're going to finish out, finish all of our sampling. We've got one more storm to sample. We have biweekly sampling. We have quarterly sampling. Um, update our reports. And really a big push this year is getting this source tracking grant big project done and move on to some newer projects. And I welcome any questions. Uh, thank you, Dr. Murray, for a very comprehensive uh, discussion and overview. Are there any questions, comments, or suggestions from any of the members of the committee? Uh, Ms. Lomas? In your testing, um, sediment testing especially, can you test for fire retardants, which are mostly, um, well, they're mostly a fertilizer-based <coughs> materials? Or do you test for fertilizers? We, we don't test for fertilizers and we don't test for nutrients. I mean, the fertilizers, I'm thinking nutrients. We te test for nutrients in water, but not sediment. I th um, so you're not talking about specific organic compounds? Well, I'm I'm thinking about basically the fire retardant that is sprayed oh, right. during fires. If, yeah, okay. Fos we yeah, phosphates. Yes, we looked. Um, we do test for phosphates, and they're high, and that we haven't been able to um, conduct the kind of testing that would be required, um, more academic level of testing to figure out um, if they're coming from fire retardant. We also looked: are there any specific organic? compounds that we could test for. We were not able to um, figure out any. I do know that LTER the, um, on campus at UCSB, the Coastal Long-Term Ecological Research Project, some of those investigators have, I think, an ongoing project to compare watersheds. And I think that they probably will have the best shot at looking at phosphate levels and seeing if they seem to be um, 
related to the fire retardant. Have you seen a peak of the phosphates after the fires or been pretty steady? I haven't analyzed that data. Okay, thank you. Thanks, Natasha. Are there any other questions, comments, uh, suggestions for future research? Uh, Danielle? Do you have a working hypothesis as to what's causing the emerging you know, increase in pyrethroid pesticides? I, well, uh, the use has been increasing, um, just the commercial use there, as other pesticides have been phased out, then they've been replaced. This is going to be an ongoing cycle, I imagine. Um, and I think it's, they're used in a lot of uh, over-the-counter, over the commercially available, the hardware store type pesticides, especially um, ant uh, pesticides. But I think they're used a lot in, uh, as termite, uh, for termite control, especially, and we have problems with subterranean termites in Santa Barbara and Goleta, and the Basically, they trench around a house and just fill it with uh, this pyrethroid, and I'm sure some of that must escape during runoff. And some of the uh, some of the first papers are coming out about this. Um, I think the most of the research has been done in the Bay Area. I think just last year were a couple of the first papers, so um, we're not the only community, and it's it's an, a rising concern. We've also tested for some other emerging pesticides that are also replacements. Um, I can't remember the names right now, but we have not found those. There's about five others that we've added to our testing list, and we haven't found those. Mm. Uh, Ms. French? <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, and on the Mission Creek, I'm trying to correlate what you talked about with the slime back to the problem at Mission, not Mission Creek, excuse me, at Arroyo Borough. You know, as you come down and you've got this lagoon, and uh, I was wondering where you were going with that hy hypothetically, because I know you don't necessarily have the data. Well, I think that there could be a lot of bacterial biofilm covering sediment surfaces in Arroyo Borough estuary, and I think there could be a lot of indicator bacteria growth in the water column, too. It's very nutrient rich. You can see those algae blooms, the rust colored algae blooms. As those algae die, there's a lot of um, organic material for bacteria to grow on. Uh, yeah, well, that is in, occurring in the estuary, yes. Uh, thank you, Ms. French. Uh, I was really pleased to see um, uh, the rigor of uh, Stephanie Dolmott uh, continuing to provide to the program. And um, she's been uh, so enthusiastic and hardworking that uh, I hope by the time she completes her graduate work uh, this coming June that some uh, position uh, opens up here on the South Coast so we can keep someone of that talent uh, within the local community. Uh, I, know, I know she really enjoys uh, the uh, work she's able to do uh, for the Creeks Division. If there, if there are no other questions or comments or suggestions on Dr. Murray's report, uh, that would probably uh, close uh, Section 8B. I want to thank Dr. Murray for updating us, and uh, I'm sure we can work with um, uh, with our staff and our incoming chair to schedule. Uh, a special background briefing for the new committee members um, if uh, they feel there'd be some uh, value in that uh, because obviously uh, uh, Jill's just skimming the surface of uh, a lot of history and a lot of chemistry and a lot of law uh, uh, and, and you did it very, very well in a very short time. So uh, thank you. And um, before we come to item number nine, I'd like to remind all the members of the committee uh, to look at the last sheet in their packet. And uh, this is um, an estimated um, calendar schedule for committee meetings for the rest of the year. So uh, when you get a chance, please match it up with your personal and work calendar. And if it turns out that um, you may not be able to attend on a particular day, if you get the word back either to the chair or to the committee staff as quickly as possible sometimes, 
uh, it's important to see if we're going to have a quorum and other times it might be possible if it's an important topic, you know, to uh, uh, slide the meeting time, although we try to uh, avoid that because of the need for the rooms. So are, are there any final questions or is there a motion to adjourn? Um, a motion to adjourn. All right, it's been moved that we adjourn. Is there a second? Second that. All right, it's been moved and is seconded. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstentions? We are adjourned at 642. Thank you very much for a great meeting.